très heureux d'être ici en personne avec vous. Comme Scott l'a dit, j'ai participé. I'm happy to be here with you today. As Scott said, I participated in all the annual conferences you've had since 2013. But it's since 2019 that I wasn't able to join you in person. So I'm extremely happy to be here once again in person. I'd like to thank uh, Scott Pierce, who accepted uh, to be interim president. Uh, Scott, although you've been in position only for two months, I'm happy that you are here to represent uh, Quebec francophones and small municipalities. Thank you very much for your leadership. I want to begin by taking a moment to recognize all the mayors in Western Canada and the North uh, whose communities have been affected by wildfires. Thank you for everything you're doing to keep people safe. I visited affected areas in Alberta last week and saw firsthand what people are going through. Got to thank the members of the Canadian Armed Forces for stepping up, but mostly got to see Canadians at their very best, people there for each other in times of difficulty, and know that all Canadians stand with you during these difficult times. For almost a decade, actually for a decade now, I've made a point of showing up at every FCM annual conference, and I always will. Because the work municipalities do is so important. Now, all of you remember that the previous federal government didn't get that. But I know that you're on the front lines of delivering for Canadians. Everything from maintaining roads and public transit that gets people to work and school every day, to the social work of helping feed and house the most vulnerable people. There is so much that you do. And we need to be partners in it if we want to truly serve people in the best possible way in these challenging times. It has been and remains important to me that we build a strong, continuing relationship where we meet regularly. Because with that comes a level of trust where we can be direct and honest with each other. Bien des choses ont changé au fil des ans. Et aujourd'hui, many things have changed over the years. And now change is uh, happening more quickly. Citizens expect their governments to act ambitiously in a concrete fashion to get results. During the pandemic, Canadians worried about their health and their jobs. So we financed the security programs so that the provinces and territories could work with municipalities to protect their populations. People want to be safe in their community. They're concerned, they're worried uh, by violence and crime, and that's why my government uh, f uh, banned uh, assault rifles and handguns. Last week, the House of Commons ac adopted uh, the major arm control act for generations and will continue to work together to keep our municipalities safe. People are also concerned by climate change and the consequences of climate changes, such as floods, forest fires, and uh, hurricanes. That is why a government is seeing to it that uh, programs such as the catastrophe program are in place to protect the resiliency of our communities and infrastructure faced with these climate and natural catastrophes. That's also the reason why we launched a national strategy of adaptation. But one of the main concerns of Canadians, something that I'd like to discuss with you today, is the increase in housing costs. It's a problem that the federal government cannot solve alone. We have to work together to find a solution to this problem is felt by every one of us in this room, no matter where you're from. Housing affordability is no longer a Vancouver or Toronto problem. It's no longer just even an urban problem. It's a problem in all of our communities. 
young people and families are, have to be, are being pushed to leave their cities. This is putting new pressure on smaller and smaller communities, driving up their housing costs. And seniors on fixed incomes everywhere are struggling. We need to be thinking about the kinds of towns and cities we want, the kind of country we want. Because without sufficient housing in our communities, our economies are held back. Since 2015, we've helped nearly 2 million families and individuals get the housing they need. And Canada has increased our, house, house, our social housing stock after decades of no growth and even declines. We're doing this through programs that create housing for vulnerable people, including those experiencing homelessness, like the Rapid Housing Initiative. The first two rounds of the RHI exceeded expectations and are on track to create more than 10,000 units instead of the 7,500 initially expected. That includes more than 3,300 3, units to support women and more than 4,200 units to support Indigenous peoples. With round three, this program will continue to deliver because we're working directly with you, directly with municipalities. Just this Tuesday, Minister Hussein announced funding for affordable housing in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. And then on Wednesday, funding was announced for hundreds more units in Hamilton. But even more housing is needed everywhere, a lot more. On a besoin de partenaires motivés. We need the motivated partners in the NGOs and the municipalities and at every level of government. A national strategy for housing allowed us to reach results for Canadians, but we must continue the work. Not only do we need housing for people with lower revenues. For years now, the middle class has seen an increase in the cost of housing, and for too many people, access to housing is beyond their reach. That's not good for families, or for our economy, or for our communities. And you also know the way I do. What are the consequences when the price of housing is too high? Nurses, teachers, workers uh, that are needed in your municipalities cannot find acceptable housing for their families. Someone who wants to create a new business is concerned by the fact that they cannot recruit worker, workers because the price of housing is too high in the region. And as your economy is developed, uh, manpower shortages increase, and you have enough housing in your community to welcome new arrivals that you need. We need to increase the supply of housing. It's that simple. Our government wants to see housing construction double over the coming years. Now, no single order of government can solve this alone, but we're putting real dollars behind this target. In March, to eliminate barriers to new housing supply, we launched the Housing Accelerator Fund. Through the program, we will directly fund municipalities' action plans with the boldest plans resulting in the most housing units, especially affordable units, being rewarded. It's a flexible and adaptable program that recognizes that municipalities are on the front lines of confronting our housing crisis. This isn't easy work, and we know that accelerating the housing pipeline comes with costs to you. That's why we're stepping up with $4 billion to be your partners in this work. Now that's pretty different from the approach the opposition talks about wanting to take. They want to pick fights with you, to bully you into what they decide for you while they cut funding and programs. <laughs> Gatekeepers. That doesn't respect the unique needs of your communities or the complexity of the work ahead. It sure looks like the leader of the opposition hasn't learned very much since he sat in Stephen Harper's cabinet. 
We are taking a collaborative approach to addressing the housing crisis that treats you as partners, as we always have. But make no mistake, to meet the needs of Canadians, <clears throat> all of us, and especially all of you, are going to need to continue to step up. As I've told you many times, I also need you to keep help pushing provinces and territories, too. For houses to get built, we need you to confront head-on nimbyism and be bold in your solutions. We need to see project timelines accelerated. We need to see zoning reforms and the missing middle housing. We need reductions in administrative and construction fees. We need more partnerships with nonprofits. We need to unlock underused land like brownfields and land near city centers while also protecting those parks and green spaces that make our cities so livable. We need to keep our communities accessible to public transit, which means being strategic and aggressive in densification. I want to talk about that last piece for a moment, because where you build houses matters a lot. As you know, two years ago, our government made a historic investment in public transit. We're moving forward with permanent public transit funding. And we're now looking at how best this funding can be used to build more transit for Canadians, especially where it's needed most. And I want to emphasize two things on transit. One, you can count on us for long-term, predictable funding to support your growing transit systems. And two, access to full funding will rely on you coming to the table with concrete and ambitious commitments on how you're going to build more housing to go with more transit. That means that just like the Housing Accelerator Fund, the more ambitious your housing targets, the more generous we'll be able to be in partnering with you. And we know you can do it. We've seen some fantastic examples of innovation and ambition over the past few years. Since 2021, Calgary has converted 10 underused office buildings into residences, with the city working with developers to reduce red tape. <laughs> Guelph just approved a new housing pledge to facilitate the construction of 18,000 new homes by 2031. Montréal, travaille avec de nombreux partenaires. Montreal is working with many partners uh, to build and preserve uh, affordable housing, is, uh, including places like Le Plateau. I was really happy to see City Council recently voted in favor of legalizing multiplexes in all neighborhoods. Innovations like these unlock supply and keep our neighborhoods dynamic. But most importantly, they create the homes that Canadians need. We can't hesitate anymore. We can't adopt half measures. Nobody can close their eyes on the urgency of this file, whether it's in a big city or in a small village. Every one of you has the capacity and the duty to change the situation. Every one of you has an essential tool to act, and you are creative. The more audacious you are, the more we'll support you, and the more you'll see the growth of your communities. Our economies and our communities are becoming stronger and more diverse, and the new investments we're making are reinvigorating cities and towns across the country. I'm thinking of places like Bridgewater, Surrey, Bicancourt, Alliston, or particularly on my mind, St. Thomas, Ontario. It's about two and a half hours west of here. I know I was just there yesterday afternoon. St. Thomas is a proudly blue-collar Canadian town. For generations, a lot of people there worked at a major auto assembly plant. But under the previous government, after the last recession, the local plant closed. But you all know, when a company leaves town, it 
hollows out communities. It means that workers don't visit the local lunch counters, that kids, soccer, and baseball teams lose their sponsors, that families move away. Well, earlier this year, we announced that Volkswagen has chosen St. Thomas to build their first ever overseas gigafactory. This massive facility will create thousands upon thousands of great jobs, and not just at the battery factory, throughout the community and throughout the surrounding region. Now, the Conservative leader didn't support this investment, but the local Conservative MP, and certainly Mayor Joe Preston, sure did. They understand just how transformative this investment is going to be for the people of Southern Ontario. And Volkswagen has made clear that they're not just setting up shop for the next decade. They plan to be in St. Thomas for the next century. This is the kind of long-term vision and long-term belief we need to have in our communities. And this is exactly the kind of thinking our government has put behind major investments. Les investissements pour investments to uh, strengthen health care, to avoid the closing of clinics and hospitals. Investment in uh, child care, which allows families to save thousands of dollars per year, that allow the construction of infrastructure in your communities, that creates local jobs, that help parents, especially mothers, to build a career of their choice, and which gives the young generation of Canadians the best start possible in life. And, as in the case of our investment of $180 billion in the plan Invest in Canada, the objective is the growth of our economy invest in clean growth and build communities who are more inclusive and reinforcing the middle class. We've allocated billions to partnerships with provinces that have meant real benefits for municipalities. We've invested in over 4,200 public transit vehicles, including electric buses, light rail transit, and other projects that are cutting both pollution and congestion in our big cities. We've invested in new community and cultural centers, like the new Kwanlin Dunn First Nation Community Hub that opened in Whitehorse last fall. A shout out to Whitehorse there, there you go. And we've invested in over 1,000 water and wastewater systems. Now, Wastewater systems might not seem that sexy to people at home, but for those of us in this room, va va voom. <laughs> I'll also point out that infrastructure like this underpins plans to build more housing. As we chart a course for the future of infrastructure in Canada, we're committed to remaining a steady partner. But we need to make work together to make sure we're building well for the next generation. Our next long-term infrastructure plan will be revealed this fall, and like with public transit, I can share with you today that this funding will have very direct links to housing. I'd like to come back on the, I'd like to come back on the housing crisis. This is linked to a generation of underinvestment. The housing crisis has touched many people, including millennials. Many millennials think they'll never be able to buy a house where they can raise their families, something which was much easier for their parents and grandparents. That is what we must think of when we think of long-term investment. We must think of the responsibility that each generation has to build for the next generation. Our economy has had an extraordinary recovery, with job numbers staying strong for nearly two years now. The pandemic also laid bare 
a lot of issues. And these are things that our government and a lot of you have been working really hard to address with real progress being made. Pierre Polyev spends his time talking down Canada and pushing his brokenest perspective. But that's an awfully pessimistic and defeated way to look at the world and the work our communities have done to stay strong and rebuild. His only plan seems to be cutting programs and cutting investments. But as leaders, we face a lot of difficult choices every day. And as each of you knows, to lead is to choose. Well, let us choose to take action, to put nimbyism aside and say yes to new opportunities. Let's choose to build housing that will welcome in new people and new energy and new growth for our communities. Let's choose to keep people at the center of everything we do. Let's choose to build a Canada that works for all Canadians. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much.